The following interview is with Sophia Kaufman. Sophia studied anthropology at Harvard and gained her master's in medical anthropology and public health at Cambridge University. She has worked at the World Health Organization and is currently a project coordinator and researcher at Brack James P. Grant School of Public Health in Bangladesh, where she has conducted research on human trafficking in the Jashore border region. She now joins Generation Director Zakitas for an interview on human trafficking. This series is promoting the charity Tab for a Cause. If you're interested in supporting solutions to international issues with a simple Chrome extension, please click the link in the video description. Hello and welcome back to the Worldview uh, interview series. Uh, this is the side of the Worldview series where we show the full uncut um, documentary interviews that we did. This is for our human trafficking episode that we have uh, previously released. It's going to be in the description down below, as well as the other interviews we did with other members of the research team and other areas of human trafficking that we researched for that documentary and interviewed. Uh, today we have with us uh, Sophia Kaufman. Uh, hi, Sophia. Hey, how are you? Uh, so, Sophia, you want to just start off by kind of saying like what you do and kind of your connection to human trafficking? Sure. So my background is in social anthropology and global health. And I started working with this research team in Bangladesh doing health research as a program coordinator, um, running different research projects, looking at health indicators and culture and how those come together. So I'm mainly working on a program uh, right now on anti-human trafficking between Bangladesh and India along the border of the two countries for specifically women and children who are being sexually exploited. And, and in your work, like what kind of challenges have you faced on like a research side of things and kind of what experiences have you faced there? I mean, I guess the obvious ones are, I'm not Bangladeshi, I'm white and I'm a young woman. So those definitely have brought some challenges working in the field. People may be more distrustful to talk to me or do interviews. I have to go through a translator and work very closely with my team. Um, but some more that are less obvious, you know, the challenges are that we're working with a highly vulnerable group of people and we are trying to get data and information, but we also have to be really sensitive to the traumatic nature of many of these people's stories, um, as well as how it could implicate people in crimes um, or reveal something that is uh, criminal, as well as, you know, if the government has been corrupt or hasn't done something, we also have to know our place in society and what we can and can't do. Um, but ultimately, you know, we took a mini bus out to do our field work through different rural areas of Bangladesh and interviewed many different people. Sometimes we would do a group where we would all be sitting on the floor and have 20 or 30 women and just have an open group discussion. Um, other times we did more formal one on one interviews. And those were sort of the ways that we collected data, but sometimes the less formal uh, on the spot interviews tended to give the best information, which unfortunately you can't plan, but sort of come about. Um, in one case, we went to the border just to sort of look at the unmarked areas. And I went to go pet uh, a little baby cow. And that sort of set off the, the border security, I guess, had some binoculars and saw someone going <laughs> in unmarked territory. And the border security came over to sort of check out what was going on. And that opened up a really great opportunity for an informal interview for us to get some information about the work that they did. Um, and it sort of just happened on a fluke. But definitely challenges of, of getting around, finding people to interview and collecting all that data. And then all the challenges that have come with, with COVID and Corona have definitely changed the way that we've been able to do our research recently, so. It's fascinating. <laughs> so going into uh, your research itself um, on human trafficking. So one of the things that we're speaking about in the documentary is uh, kind of starting off with what makes a victim vulnerable. So could you go over on how victims are targeted and what characteristics makes victims most vulnerable of being targeted by traffickers? Yeah, so it's different uh, on region or where you are, but typically those risk factors are 
pretty common among different populations. So it's often people who are poor and looking for work or opportunities who are pretty desperate for anything that will come across their desk. Um, often people who don't have support systems with family members, so women who are divorced um, or orphan children, um, so really not having the support system or the financial uh, security that they need. Um, and oftentimes they'll target specific localities to find that type of person, whether it's slums where many poor people live in one crowded area, or brothels where they know that women and children are struggling to make money. Um, so they'll target specific at-risk areas like that young men who are just out of school, who are looking for work and who are employable. And those groups often uh, are pretty common among, among different countries, yeah. Sorry, muted. Um, in, in our research, uh, we we kind of broke it down into three categories of sex uh, of human trafficking. There's obviously a bit more of a, a fluid nature to this categorization. Categorization, uh, but in your research, could you kind of define the the three types of trafficking that we're kind of going over, which are uh, sex, labor, and domestic servitude? Could you take a moment and kind of define each one for us? Yeah. So trafficking in essence, is being forced to do something against your will and not being able to leave. So in all of those, there are some commonalities, which may be you don't have access to a phone to get out, you don't have access to your passport, you're locked in a room, so you're physically bound. Um, so it could be physical force, but it also can be coercion. So verbal, you know, lies or uh, threats against your family. Um, and then the difference between those three is really what I guess you're partaking in. So with labor trafficking, the motive of the trafficker is to get free labor out of you um, and will often take you to a factory or a field and you're almost a sort of indentured servitude where you can't leave, you can't make money um, and you're being exploited through your labor. Um, similarly, but in the other case with sexual uh, trafficking and sexual exploitation, you're often forced to partake in um, different sexual acts and things like that, or either for money or for the, the pleasure of the person who's trafficking you, and also you're unable to leave. And for organ trafficking, um, you're often trafficked for your organs. Um, in some cases, they take your organ and leave you and you're able to survive and get home but you've been robbed of part of your body in other cases they might keep you you know captive for the trafficking of your organs but in all of those cases it's really a commercial market to try and profit off of something within your body right either your labor um, or a physical part of your body for you know a capital gain from someone else so one of the, the best resources uh, for looking into human trafficking uh, can be found with the U.S. State Department's uh, Trafficking in Persons Report, their TIP report, and their, their tier ranking, which especially in Bangladesh is kind of an uh, important area uh, to note. So is it possible that you could go in and explain kind of in brief uh, what the TIP report is and how the tier ranking system works? Yeah, so the, the ranking is basically a guide to show how well a country is or isn't abiding by um, human trafficking laws and how much work they're doing to reduce human trafficking in that country. And so probably unsurprisingly, um, developed countries in Europe and the U.S. are doing pretty well on anti-human trafficking because they are well equipped with both the resources and the lawmakers to really follow those regulations. They also typically don't have as high of a trafficking problem because there is a really strong economy where people can make money in different ways and there hasn't really been this huge push um, for exploitation through trafficking. So a country like Bangladesh has is a, is a tier two country, which means that they have shown that they have made a lot of effort to disrupt human trafficking, but they haven't quite reached the mark of uh, what would be expected of a tier one country. And so every year they'll look at the country, they'll look at the laws that have been implemented, 
They'll look at the funding that has gone towards disrupting human trafficking. They'll look at the numbers of trafficking that's been reported, and then they'll make an assessment of where a country falls. So Bangladesh has done quite a bit to improve their ranking over the years and put quite a bit of funding towards new policies and laws in human trafficking, but they still have a really huge problem, specifically because they do have such a poor population um, and because of their local locality next to India and close to the Middle East where there's a high demand for human uh, humans being trafficked. So they've done quite a bit to try and show that they've committed to pretty much universal guidelines of anti-human trafficking, but they haven't quite been able to hit those implementation on the ground to reduce their numbers. Um, so that's one thing that Bangladesh is really working on to try and get their numbers down that match what they've verbally committed to. So in cross-border trafficking specifically opposed to internal, um, one of the most common areas of exploitation is amongst uh, migrant workers. Um, which I know is something that your research kind of covers for Bangladeshis trying to work abroad. Uh, so what might cause a migrant worker to pursue work abroad in the first place? Yeah, I mean, I guess the essence is there, there isn't uh, enough work locally. Most people don't want to leave their home. They don't want to leave their families. Um, but really, it's the opportunities abroad that you know, cause them to leave. And there's sort of this push-pull system where they say, you know, the push factors are maybe no jobs or poverty. The pull factors are the opposite, more jobs, more opportunity. So when those two things come together, they often cause cross-border migration. And where there is heavy migration without regulation and strong systems to support it, there's often exploitation, which leads to trafficking. So in the case of Bangladesh, with two borders, with India um, on the west and uh, Myanmar or Burma on the right, there is a lot of traffic and migration that's going between them. And I mean, specifically for Bangladesh, a lot of the people who are being trafficked for labor migration through Bangladesh and to India um, and to the Middle East actually are not even Bangladeshi, they're Burmese. But because of the largest refugee camp in the world right now being in Bangladesh uh, with Burmese citizens, those people are really in a difficult financial situation to have work when they're not in their home, right? So they also are becoming a really huge target for labor trafficking. And additionally, this sea border um, along the bottom of Bangladesh is another route that people are often trafficked through. Um, we've heard stories of huge boats, you know, with hundreds of migrants that are being trafficked for labor migration, uh, of labor trafficking. And we've also heard of huge graves, you know, being discovered in different Southeast, Southeast Asian countries of people who have been trafficked. Um, so it's a huge problem, and I think that as the further away people go from their home, the more risk they have to take. Um, and oftentimes they're desperate to do it in an illegal way. They don't have the right paperwork or visas to get a job. So there are inherent risks in that pathway, um, and they might know that trafficking is also a risk, but there's often very little choice, at least they feel there's very little choice when it comes to survival and supporting their families. So in this process that you described, uh, one of the, the first levels of kind of, the first steps that's taken is a local trafficker luring a victim across the border, um, you know, convincing them through one way or another. What, what tactics have you seen used by these traffickers in your research to lure people? Yeah, I mean, it varies quite a bit. And I would say probably um, the, the area that I was the most surprised about and probably the most naive when I started this research is how those tactics work, those coercive tactics. And I think like for, probably from dramatized TV, we often think like someone is trafficked, they're kidnapped in the night with a blanket over their head, you know, and they're screaming and they can't get out, which is very rarely the case. Um, often it's coercion. And that often comes from people that the person, the survivor or the victim is closest to. And so it could be a husband, a father, a mother, a sibling. Those are really common tactics that 
there's a whole chain of traffickers doing that type of work. If it's not a family member, it's often a coworker or someone in the community that you tend to know pretty well. And so you have this level of trust and comfort with them already. Um, and it often starts off with, uh, oh, I know you were working at the mill and you lost your job recently. And I actually know of another job that is way better. You can w make way more money. Um, or, you know, just word of mouth, hearing that there are more jobs in a place like India or the Middle East, and then sort of having that conversation with someone who offers to help you. So it can be expensive to travel to the border. Um, many people don't know how to travel and find those jobs. So these are almost like job hunters. Um, in some cases, the victim will search for those people and, and look for them themselves. Uh, and they say they'll connect you to the job. They often charge quite a bit of money for that. So they seem more legitimate. They can help you get papers. They can help you get a visa, a passport. And so all of those things sort of add to what seems like legit legitimacy that they will actually get you a job. Um, they might connect you to employers so you can talk to someone who seems like an employer or introduce you to someone else who did a similar journey, who was successful. And all of those things can sort of feed into the coercion. And the chain of traffickers is really part of the way that it's difficult to track traffickers down, is if a sibling convinces you to go to the border and then a husband convinces you to cross the border and there are three or four traffickers all working together, um, you can really get far away from home with very little way of knowing how to get back. So once they're taken from their home or lured, not always, uh, sometimes consensual at this point in the, the phase, uh, when they get to the border, what are common tactics uh, that traffickers use for trafficking victims, either across land borders, uh, sea borders, or possibly even using airways? Yeah, so specifically for the Bangladesh-Indian border, it's a huge border. Large areas are unmarked and are forest areas, so many people try and sneak across in the night, um, in which case they often have little homes along the border that they use as little shelters for one, two, three nights, where the victim will stay there, uh, either locked or told some lies to stay there until the trafficker has spotted an opening in the border. In the night, they'll take that route across. In other cases, they have some sort of elaborate story that this is their husband, which in some cases it is, or they're going on a holiday or as a tourist. So coming up with some sort of lie to get across to the border. Uh, in other cases, they take sea routes or river routes. Uh, via little boats to try and sort of sneak across the border. Um, but what we found is that the most obvious ones sneaking across the border would in theory be the easiest ones to stop because it's, it's pretty obvious that something illegal or not right is happening. But when they are willingly going across the border, being coerced, um, saying they're going to visit family or saying that they're going to, you know, a holiday, there's very little that the border security can do. Um, because if they're willingly going in a legal way, then, you know, even if you think this might be an at-risk person, you're really incapable of stopping, of stopping them crossing the border. And for the, the sea route, uh, what are common uh, ways of going about that? I mean, for the sea route, in some cases, they take large boats for lots of uh, labor migrants who are going to a certain location. Um, they'll take little boats, like little canoes, when they're in the area of like the Ganges between Bengal, where it's mostly mangrove forests. So there are a lot of little small tributaries in between the land. It's very hard to monitor that area as well. Um, and, you know, with big boats going, at night or at different times, it's pretty hard to intercept them. And uh, lastly, uh, and our last interview, Yatib kind of focused on this for a little bit, was um, airway travel, like who's specifically targeted for that and how do they usually do that uh, method? 
Yeah, I mean, so airway travel is interesting. It seems to be usually more legal because you need more legal paperwork, like a passport to travel. It's often really expensive. So usually the trafficker will pay that fee, whether it's for the air ticket um, and the flight. And then you're already starting off on this foot where you owe your trafficker money. And it starts a really easy cycle of um, not being able to pay your trafficker back and incurring debt, even if it's not um, a traditional trafficking case. Part of the reason that that's a common pathway is there's a really high demand for labor in the Middle East, especially for maids in the household or chefs or cooks. Um, so people are easily convinced because there are quite a few job opportunities that are legitimate. So distinguishing a legitimate job opportunity from a trafficking opportunity is really difficult. And once you're in another country, like let's say you're in Qatar, if your uh, employer takes away your passport, you have very little way to get home. If you have no money, you can't buy a flight. So it's even more difficult to get back home after being trafficked so far away via flight. Um, and without a phone, speaking the language, you know, you could be in a, in a tough situation very quickly. And I find that a lot of them, those Middle Eastern countries don't have strong labor laws in general for migrant workers that are coming to do that type of work. Um, and so there are sites online where, you know, you can buy and sell servants like slaves. And although you're not legally technically allowed to list them like slaves, you're not allowed to take away their passport. The system is set up in a way that they're treated like a commodity, which definitely incentivizes um, if you buy something, you want to get the most out of it. But you're also often not feeling like you need to pay a fair wage or offer them vacation or sick days because you paid for it. So the system in itself is set up to facilitate trafficking and uh, violate human rights in many cases. Um, but there are quite a few job opportunities, especially with the money coming out of oil and gas and, and things like that. So people are often going from a poor country to a wealthier country. You sort of hit on our, our next question here, which is um, what kind of work do uh, victims uh, end up in when they're at their destination and what conditions are they in? Um, if you feel like you already covered that in the last answer, you don't have to answer this one, but if you have more, uh, feel free. Yeah, I mean, I think in many cases, it would be maybe what we consider normal work, like being a house cleaner, um, but then they're not paid for that work. Then they're expected to do cooking as well and cleaning 24 seven, um, and they're not allowed to leave. So not only is it exploit, labor exploitation, but they're also not getting paid or having freedom to leave. And then oftentimes in those spaces, they're sexually exploited. So that might not necessarily be the nature of their work that brings in money, but it also might be a part of their living day-to-day -day situation that they can't escape. In other cases, it's working in a factory, um, or it could be working in a brothel. And once those people are sold in a way, so one trafficker is making money, the person who's bought the person as a commodity often feels like they own them. And in that case, they're trying to exploit them for whatever it is that they see uh, viable, whether it's uh, sexual exploitation, labor exploitation, or organ exploitation. Um, it's all about making money in a capitalistic regime. So. So segueing, as you kind of said, like the, the main way out of this is uh, for victims to escape in some capacity. And I know in your research, uh, you and your teammates have interviewed a lot of uh, victims who have been repatriated. Could you tell us a little bit about pathways you've seen victims take to return to their home country and leave these um, uh, trafficking circumstances? Yeah, I mean, it often is pretty arbitrary in if people almost get lucky for one of the pathways that exists. In some cases, if they're stuck and trapped in a brothel, sometimes the police of that country will do what's called a brothel bust, where they'll raid the brothel and look for anybody who is underage, they're against their will, or not a citizen of that country. 
So in some cases that we came across, they did one of these uh, bus or, or uh, raids in India and they found, you know, young children that were Bangladeshi. Maybe they didn't speak, you know, the language of the country. And so that's sort of a tip off that they're not from here. Um, and we're able to get them separate and interview them, in which case they would then uh, repatriate them back to their country because they don't want them there. They're not legally there. They don't have uh, even a work visa to be there. So it's also usually in the country's best interest to get them out, whether it's what the victim wants or not, right? Um, in other cases, especially in the Middle East, it was often a case that well, women who had been trafficked for labor migration and sexually exploited would run away and uh, would run to the police station. Sometimes they were in jail for one or two years before they were repatriated back to their country because they were illegally in that country without a work permit. Um, so it wasn't that they were being repatriated necessarily for their own safety or their own good, but the country just didn't want to host them, uh, whether they had been exploited or not. Um, in other cases, it's more of the endeavor of the family or an NGO. Maybe a survivor is able to get a hold of a phone and call their family and say, I'm stuck here. And if the family is lucky, they're able to connect with a local NGO that can help with the rescue of that person. Um, in the case of BRAC, with them working with repatriating women and children back to Bangladesh, they often are told, look, we have three or four people who we either located during a raid at the police station or who have reached out to us for help. And these are people that we've identified as being capable of, of coming back to their home country. And in that case, the NGO will help facilitate that repeat repatriation. So speaking on repatriation specifically, can you describe uh, the, the common process that many face? Um, you know, sometimes there, there's long legal situations, other times they use different means of getting back to their home countries. So, so what are some common uh, approaches that you've seen? Yeah, I mean, it, it definitely varies on the country and the people who are doing the repatriation. Sometimes it can take a really long time. But usually there's a process of identification, maybe going through a police station and doing an initial report, getting all of the information that they can. Um, and then that person is often accompanied throughout the journey back home and sometimes passed off from one country to another. So if there are two NGOs working on the repatriation, they would then hand off that person to the NGO in the home country to then do the repatriation work once they're in their home country. In other cases, it's this push off model where they literally take them to the border and then just say, okay, you're home. And people are often really left to their own devices to try and figure out how to put together their life um, with nothing. So obviously the, the model where there is a handoff and there are two countries working together and two different groups of NGOs working together works much better. Um, in which case, those victims will be referred to a police station, which will then refer them hopefully to a transitional shelter home, psychology and mental health services, physical health services, um, and other resources on how to get a job or at least to have a sustainable life for the near future in their home country. So you touched on this a little bit as well, uh, which is the next phase, which is of course reintegration. Um, and with this, there not only comes uh, what you've described, which is uh, the need for kind of financial uh, restabilizing for themselves, but also of course the nature of stigma uh, in many communities that they may face and which could lead to their continued vulnerability. Could you speak on that? Yeah. So. I mean, there are different types of stigma. Generally, a stigma is just that you left and you came back with nothing. Um, so families have financially supported this person a lot and don't understand why that person is coming back empty handed. It's a huge burden on those families uh, financially. Often they've had to take care of this person's children um, and have a lot of resentment towards that. 
the stigma gets even deeper uh, when it's associated with something taboo or shameful in the community, which is often the case with sexual exploitation. If people know that you were doing sex work, working in a brothel, or sexually exploited, you're often shamed and, stig and, and face a lot of stigma, in which case a lot of the survivors don't share that part of their story, and they lie about what actually happened to them, which sort of acts as a double-edged sword because if you don't tell the truth, people don't understand why did you come back why didn't you get any money like why do you are you feeling so low all the time those things don't add up but if they did tell the real story they might face real repercussions from both their community and their families they might be kicked out of the home their husbands might divorce them um, or make them leave um, so there, there can be real consequences to that stigma and shame they might not be able to get a job or be employed because people don't see them worthy or as humans. So working with the survivor for the reintegration process to help them have you know, positive health and work on their mental health and their trauma is important, as well as working with the communities to help educate them on what these real issues are to get rid of that stigma that is associated with trafficking and, and victims of trafficking. So for many victims who return, repatriate and uh, reintegrate, uh, some would understandably want some degree of justice for what happened. However, in Bangladesh specifically, though numbers vary, uh, it's around 4% that are successfully prosecuted and convicted of the tra crime of trafficking, despite uh, trafficking laws being put much more strictly in order in the 2012 Act. Um, so could you speak as to why there's such a low rate of prosecution of traffickers in Bangladesh? Yeah, it's a culmination of a lot of different factors. The first one is that it's really difficult to prove that you've been tra you've been trafficked and who your trafficker is. And it often comes to a he said, she said situation, if you can even locate the trafficker in the first place. Because of these trafficker chains, it's often really difficult to even identify who your trafficker is. Um, in other cases, your trafficker is a family member and people aren't willing or able to prosecute against their own family because maybe they will be uh, facing a lot of consequences from that from their community and family that will be more harmful than beneficial. And uh, so those are two things is, is not having evidence. If even if you can identify the trafficker, how do you prove that they took money from you? The trafficker often has many ways of covering their tracks. They take cash or they go through other people. Um, and so if you willingly went, which we said, you know, many people do, and it, and you were culpable in this scheme, maybe you got yourself an illegal passport or you got yourself an illegal visa or you snuck across the border, you're now implicated in the crime yourself. And so many people are fearful that they will face some sort of cri criminal legal repercussion if they tell the true story because they know that they were doing something illegal along the way. Um, which has been the case for many people with a system that is not really doing a very good job of differentiating between a victim and a criminal in many cases. Um, the other thing is that, you know, it's a long process. The trafficking prosecution process can be years and years and years. So that's exhausting financially as well as with time. People can't afford to get off work, to go to the courthouse all the time to testify. That can be exhausting and traumatic to have to rehash your horrible stories again and again for evidence. You might have to face your trafficker in court, which can be also traumatic, exhausting, and also dangerous if you don't have uh, victim protection, which in many cases these systems don't have um, or have very well. So then there's the added stigma that you mentioned. If your case comes to light through prosecution, your whole community might know about your case and you're gonna face a lot of stigma and shame in your community. So those all come together to really make victims less likely to 
prosecute and, and want to pursue a case. But in the few instances where they do pursue a case, the cases are often dropped early on. And for many cases, that's because of what we call a golden handshake. That was a word that people used that we interviewed. But the golden handshake was sort of that the traffickers themselves would bribe the victims to drop the case. Uh, either bribe them with money or they would coerce them to drop the case because of threats against the family. Um, and people really weren't able to evade those. Um, and in a few other cases, it was corruption. Those golden handshakes between traffickers existed with judges or prosecutors who would overlook evidence or would look at a loophole, which is if you waited too long to prosecute the case, you would have to refile it or things like that, that really made it more exhaustive for the victim who was trying to seek justice. Um, so whether the case was dropped, not filed at all, you know, it takes many years for a case to actually be seen through, in which case that really low number uh, were the few cases that were pursued and, and they were mostly probably large-scale trafficking cases where there was one like huge kingpin trafficker who trafficked hundreds of people for labor trafficking in which case the government was really incentivized to put this person you know behind bars not only because they were hurting a huge population of the people, but also to set an example, like, look at us, we're able to do this for someone who's gained some type of recognition. People know about this person. The government is incentivized to show that they are caring. When it comes to a poor farmer or a young divorced girl, there's less incentive for the government to really fight for that person's case when it takes so many resources. So for individuals where, let's say, this reintegration process didn't go super well, the prosecution didn't go super well, um, in other countries, uh, this is sometimes referred to as the Madam Pipeline. Um, I know in Bangladesh, we haven't really seen it called that as much. But uh, the, the basic root is uh, they become just as vulnerable as they were before, and so sometimes they themselves become traffickers, either at the luring level or a different level. Um, can you speak as to why a victim would become a trafficker themselves? Yeah, I mean, sometimes it's out of choice and sometimes it's out of coercion. So we saw people who were re-trafficked um, in the same situation, and they were often given an out where they said, look, we won't make you uh, do these things or we won't sexually exploit you if you recruit another girl. So maybe it starts with one recruiting one person as a way to save yourself, to protect yourself. Um, there isn't any financial incentive at that point for some people. And even though it feels morally wrong, they're just trying to protect themselves. So maybe they'll get one girl and then maybe the trafficker says, okay, if you recruit four girls, I'll give you a cut of how much you know we make from them. And if you're still in the same desperate situation that you were before, um, you know, your morals might go out the window to survive. And then this cycle repeats. Um, in other cases, people think this happened to me. So I'm going to do it to someone else. The world is not just the world is not right. Um, and it can be a form of retribution for people. But I think in most cases, it's really this cyclical pattern of people not being able to make it in other ways. And if they had another option, they would have taken that instead. So this is one of the, the more difficult questions uh, for my team, for your team, uh, which is, what do we know about the trafficking leadership? Uh, the, the godfathers, kingpins, main traffickers, they have a lot of different names. Um, sometimes they have a lot of different definitions um, and they're quite elusive to actually conduct research on. Um, could you describe what is known about them and maybe a little bit about what isn't known about them? Yeah, I mean, I think that with trafficker chains, it's obvious that those that are doing the dirty work, the ones who are, we see, the ones that get caught, they're the lowest guys on the totem pole. They're doing someone else's dirty work for them. 
they're told like bring this many girls or bring this girl from point A to point B, um, bring this bow of young men here. They're really just doing what they're told and taking a cut. They are still culpable, but they're not really the, the, big, the big man, you know, who's delegating huge, huge schemes. Those people are often not living or operating in the same communities or even countries that they're trafficking victims from. They're making tons of money and they're living somewhere else. And they're often removing themselves very much from that process. So it's very difficult to get information on them. Well, who are their names? Who are they? Unless they actually are you know, somewhere within the financial money trail or somewhere within uh, owning the brothel in one case, you know, something where it becomes very obvious who that, who that trafficker is. And they lure people in, as you said, you know, sort of from this spider network. They get one girl and they convert one girl to be a Dalal or a trafficker and so on and so on. They get one trafficker to get a couple of his friends to be traffickers. Before you know it, they have an entire spider web of operations going across countries, um, across communities, and really being not just uh, within one spot, so. And our last but most difficult question, um, and most expansive, so feel free to answer it however you'd like, uh, which is what solutions do developing countries have to, to focus on fighting human trafficking in the various areas we've spoken about today? Yeah, I mean, there are quite a few resources coming in with NGOs doing reintegration work with survivors, as well as prevention work with communities to try and prevent people from going down these risky paths that they know trafficking is a possibility and also empowering those communities to have other options for work um, that are sustainable and that can be created from within. So it's, you know, giving people chickens so that they can sell eggs. It's teaching people how to use sewing machines so that they can make their own clothing or make their own products to sell. Instead of just teaching them the trade, they also give people the resources to create their own businesses. Um, but in many cases, the most successful things came from the communities themselves where they had a community watch. They were like, who is in our community that we don't know, we don't trust? Did someone disappear from our community? How can we find them and support the family? And they really, within their community, are doing everything to protect each other. Um, they've created, in Bangladesh, many different community groups that are women's groups run by all women, men's groups run by uh, community leaders and religious leaders. There's a group called the Polish Omaj, which is basically people who are elected by the community as trustworthy leaders within the community, but they're everyday normal people with every different job you can think of. And they run these meetings with the community to discuss any type of issue, child marriage to unemployment, nutrition, you know, to health resources, to really devise local community ideas of how to, uh, support each other and how to get those resources that they need. Um, and those tend to be really effective because people trust and listen to those resources and they're integrated in the community. So they really know uh, who are the audiences that they wanna try and connect with. Um, but ultimately what I've seen is if you're coming in as an outside NGO, you have to be linked up with those communities in an integral way in order for the policies and ideas to work. Because with COVID, many international human rights and health organizations that are doing what we call the good work, uh, as soon as COVID happened, were super quick to get out and leave these communities totally abandoned with no infrastructure on how to support themselves. That's why these ground up models of people from within the community with the resources themselves are so important so that they can create their own sustainable ideas of how to reduce trafficking. Um, if it's just these outside NGOs, as soon as they leave or the money runs out, we're exactly back where we were before. And if anything, the cause 
of human trafficking is just one huge issue, which is poverty. Uh, the driver for traffickers to traffic people as well as people to go and take those risks that end up being trafficked is that people are in poverty and they need jobs. And so supporting countries through economic development, uh, seed grants for local communities, uh, sustainable ideas for how to generate income in communities have really seemed to work. BRAC has done a really great job of working in these areas with small communities. Um, but it's something that we need to think about, I think on a bigger scale of how to integrate issues like education and healthcare with the economic pieces of supporting families to have a sustainable, uh, sustainable income. Well, thank you for coming here today, Sophia. Um, it's been great having you. Very, very informed answers you had. <laughs> um, so for our, our viewers, uh, again, the full episode of the documentary will be in the description as well as the other interviews we did uh, with some of Sophia's uh, team members and other NGOs. Um, and yeah, so thank you again, Sophia. Thank you so much. <laughs>